You are going to be super disappointed by this video and with the 4090, but not for why you think. For us to say that NVIDIA's 4090 announce was mired in controversy would be, well, it'd be a bit of an understatement. I mean, numerous tech outlets and tech tubers like myself, Jay, and even traditional press sites all piled on about like the pricing of the 4080, the 4070 naming fiasco. Lastly, the fact that right around the corner on November 3rd, we have AMD's RDNA 3.0 announcement. So there's, there's kind of a lot going on when it comes to NVIDIA. There was a lot NVIDIA didn't share. Things like true rasterization numbers and a lot of numbers being inflated by DLSS 3.0 made it sound like NVIDIA was kind of up to some shenanigans. Maybe their cards aren't that good. Maybe it's a smaller increase than the very terrible rumors we had heard where like basically you needed a Dyson Sphere and your mom's hand crank generator to power the thing. And it has more compute and graphical power than all of the computers combined in Ready Player One with like 500% graphical upgrade uplift and all that kind of, you know, crap. But now, now we're down to earth. Now the day is finally here and we actually tested the card. And if you were betting against Nvidia, then unfortunately you're gonna be sorely disappointed with our review because this card, well, unfortunately, it's pretty dang awesome. Oh, and if you do like our version of the review, why not like and subscribe? This helps me and you don't miss when we do all of the other GPUs and CPUs that are coming out here very shortly. So here's how I do my thing. I try very hard to respect your time and honestly, I believe you're just looking for my recommendations. But if you do wanna draw your own conclusions from our data and see where I got my conclusions from, then you can get those uh, and nerd out at the very end of the video. There are still charts in this video, don't worry, for all of you presentation nerds. We gotta reference what we're talking about, right? But also, we share all of the raw data on our Discord server in Excel form, so if you wanna geek out over there about the numbers or like totally geek out on the spreadsheet, then oh boy, nerds unite. Just head on over to our Discord server at discord.gg slash robitech, and you can check the pin messages over in the tech chat for all of the raw data. And we have like CPU stuff over there, all sorts of stuff. So if you just wanna nerd out on data, there's your data like mine, like, like gold mine. That's what I was looking for. Now, before I get into this whole thing, let's do a quick recap for folks on what's new. I mean, I promise to keep this brief, and honestly, you can read a lot of this stuff just from looking at the, the graphics I'm gonna show you. Now, the new flagship GPU, the NVIDIA RTX 4090, is built on the Ada Lovelace architecture. This new GPU has the new third generation RT cores and fourth generation Tensor cores versus the second generation RT cores and third generation Tensor cores that were in the older, I know that's weird to say, 3090 Ti and 3080, etc. Wow, we're actually on a new generation. Now you can see here on this chart that across the board, there's an increase for shader and uh, ray tracing. You've got increases in tensor and teraflops. And you can also see that even though the power draw appears to be the same at 450 watts, because of the new four nanometer process on the 4090, we are getting more performance with the same power draw. Okay, so now that I've used some time to explain how I'm gonna use your time, Let's actually let this review begin. Our journey together through the NVIDIA RTX 4000 series. So let's start here. What is the leap from the 3090 Ti to say the 4090? Now I'm gonna use what are called raw benchmarks from 3D Mark to just kick things off. There's a reason I like to use 3D Mark. Unlike game developers who, guys, if you don't know, do take money and developers from companies like NVIDIA and AMD to use their technologies, and in many ways, they favor a particular platform. For instance, Cyberpunk with NVIDIA or Far Cry 6 with AMD. Now these benchmarks that we're gonna be using try very hard to be neutral. Now I say try hard, and it's a good way to just measure raw performance improvement from one card to the other. I feel like a lot of people don't explain why they choose the benchmarks they do, and I, I just wanna be really clear on that. Now for our test system, just so we're clear, we're using an Intel Core i9-12900K with an Asus ROG Strix Z690E motherboard. We're running Kingston Fury DDR5 with two x 16 
of Kingston Fury 6000 Mega Transfer RAM, which is enabled and has XMP. We're also running on a Seagate Fire CUDA 530 for Windows 11. We have a single one terabyte for the OS and two terabyte for the games. And that's because, hey, games like Flight Sim. Oh, and all the cards are Founders Edition cards for the NVIDIA cards, and the AMD GPU was a Sapphire Nitro Plus RX 6950 XT. So we've got our landscape, everything's clear, everything's good. Starting off with the NVIDIA RTX 3090 Founders Edition, we saw an overall 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme score of 9814. Now the current most powerful gaming card up until today was the RTX 3090 Ti with a nice jump up to 10,785 and the AMD sitting nicely between the two at 10,096. So that means the 3090 to the 3090 Ti was about a 9% jump, which uh, still equates to what we saw when we did our review on the 3090 Ti, which if you want to just do some history, you could check out right here. But what about the 4090 Roby? Well, it had a time spy score of 16,650. That's a that's no DLSS, no no funny money, no, nothing like that. That is a single 35% jump in just raw performance over the 3090 Ti or a 39% jump over the 3090 and the 6950 XT, which is crazy. And that's at 4K today. This can be a true raw 4K gaming graphics card. The whole generation previous to this with like the 3090, the 6950 XT, the 3080 Ti, etc., weren't really powerful enough to make raw 4K gaming a reality despite all the marketing. Now, when I say raw, I don't mean like with DLSS and all these other bells and whistles that are fakely kind of bringing you realistic 4K numbers, but I'm just talking about raw gaming performance. For once, you have something that you could pop into your machine and play stuff at 4K, and it feels like in a lot of ways what we were dealing with 1440p in previous generations. It's also worth noting, I just wanna make sure that I, I get this, is that when we ran like 3D Firestrike Ultra, which is another one of those more neutral benchmarks, the gains between the 3090 Ti and the 4090 jump up to a staggering 50% just in score alone. There is surprisingly a lot of raw performance here. And even though I was super frustrated at the lack of clarity in the presentation using DLSS 3.0 and all that sort of stuff about what these cards were actually capable of, it looks like it's just how NVIDIA wanted to announce their card and not some nefarious plot to bring about the sentient nature of Skynet. Though still, they do a lot of AI stuff and we're watching NVIDIA closely because I don't wanna see Terminators and that's what's keeping me up at night. Everyone's saying 1440p or 2K is just the right resolution for gaming. And you know what, honestly, previous to this point, you're absolutely right. And I still think that that is where most people are going to play, even with the birth of the Intel Arc and, and now what, what, what uh, budget cards are able to do at 1440p, it, it is awesome. Okay, so let's look at those numbers because we're talking about the 4090 here. So kicking off with our 3090, we saw a score of 19,624. And with the AMD 6, uh, 6950 coming in at 2928 and the 3090 Ti coming in at 21372. But when you throw the 4090 in there, you can see a score of 34,422. Now it's a slightly smaller uplift of 34% compared to with the 3090 Ti and a similarly slightly uplift when we used our Firestrike Ultra at only 34% versus the 50% we were seeing at 4K. Like I said, this is a 4K card. But what about games, Roby? And that's, that's really the focus. That's who we're talking to here, gamers. Now, like I said, all the charts are at the end, but let, let, me, let me give you some highlights. We tested Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Cyberpunk 2077, both with and without the new frame generation, and which I'm gonna talk about later. We had Far Cry 6, Forza Horizon, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Metro Exodus, and Tiny Tina's Adventure. At both the stated resolutions of 4K and 1440p. That smattering of games covers AMD optimized, NVIDIA optimized, just raw rasterization optimization. That's why we choose the games that we do. I'm sure that, you know, Hardware Unboxed and all those guys are gonna say like 5,000 games tested and maybe Linus is gonna do like, we're gonna play for 33 hours and you can watch and choose whatever game it is. But for the most part, I'm gonna give you enough information that you don't need to watch all that stuff unless there's a very particular game you wanna know about and really to kind of decide on what this card's gonna, honestly, it's, it's marketing fluff. This, this, what we're gonna give you is just gonna be more than enough to kind of give you an idea. 
Now for 4K, it's a pretty clear indicator of where the gains are in this card, and we've got big leaps in overall frame rates at 4K across the board. In kind of this weird case of Far Cry 6, this is that whole thing about when you sign up to, to, to sponsor AMD or you sign up to sponsor Nvidia, this is where those games can make things look a lot different. So if you got a 6950 XT, Far Cry 6 is your only game, no need to upgrade there. Every other game across the board saw a 25% on average increase in performance at 4K. Now at 1440p or 2K, it wasn't so clear cut. I mean, we did have the same weird Far Cry 6 story. And add to that, we actually had slightly worse performance from Cyberpunk 2077 as well. But this time, uplift across the board of the games, where there was uplift, we only saw 13% with three of the seven titles ending up with minimal to almost no uplift from the GPU. We're always gonna enable what is best to give them all the best uplift. So if it had DLSS, we put on DLSS. If it had FSR, it put on FSR. If it did XESS, we put on XESS. Now this is of course minus DLSS 3.0, given we wanted to, to have like a standard uplift and not frame generation to ensure that we had a true apples to apples comparison. And now that I've given you an overview of gaming and raw performance at 1440p and 4K, let's talk about the new special sauce from Nvidia that is DLSS 3 and why they focus so much of their time at the presentation about it. What's new with DLSS 3.0 and what's exclusive, meaning it only works on the 4000 series Ada Lovelace GPUs, is what's called DLSS frame generation. Now the example they showed during their keynote in Cyberpunk, none of that stuff on, AKA just pure raw performance mode, they were sitting at 23 frames per second. But when they turned on DLSS 2.0, meaning it had super resolution and NVIDIA reflex, it jumped up to 62 frames per second, which is awesome. This new thing called frame generation that took the 62 frames and bumped it up to 101 frames. And these are new frames that are added via an AI algorithm called frame generation. Now, if you do not have a 4000 series card, you will not see that jump from 62 to 101 frames. That part is locked to only the 4000 series. And that's because of this new improved technology called the optical flow acceleration that has been improved in the 4000 series card with an algorithm improvements that is like two to two and a half times faster than the ones in the 3000 series. That's an important thing because the 3000 series does in fact have an optical flow accelerator and Nvidia did actually say it could bring this technology to your 3000 series card with further op optimization and engineering to actually make it work. But as of today, that's not a thing right now. This is only stuff you're gonna see. So we could see a DLSS 3.0 on 3000 series at some point in time if, if they decide to do anything about that. Okay, so now that we have those, Let's look at our own data from Cyberpunk 2077 and see if we saw similar jumps using the settings that we use. Now you're seeing here in this graph how all the cards stack up. But let's start with the top of the stack. From last generation, and we can see with DLSS 2.0, we were getting 93 frames per second. And heck, even without DLSS 3.0, we see that the 4090 actually got a solid 128.19 frames per second, meaning it does not have frame generation on. That is just raw DLSS 2.0 performance uplift. Now, we use ultra performance for our DLSS settings just to give you the absolute highest number. But at 4K, NVIDIA recommends performance mode as an FYI. In fact, ultra performance mode is supposed to be for 8K. And we can do a whole other video on that, but again, I just wanna give you that bit of information as to why our numbers are gonna be higher than what you saw in the DLSS presentation during the keynote and so many other videos. Now, let's turn on DLSS 3.0. We see Cyberpunk jump up to 179.73 frames per second at 4K. And you can see from our capture here, remember though that this has been through the YouTube algorithm, so it really is completely non-indicative of what you'd actually see, but it actually looks great. And you're, you're gonna have to kind of trust me on this, but you're watching me, so you probably already do. See, the technology really is magic. Okay, so Roby, what about 1440p? Does it help there? 127.11 FPS on the 4090 jumps up to 254 0.9 frames per second with DLSS 3.0. That is just shy of a 50% jump in FPS. It is very impressive. And we were blown away that you couldn't tell that the AI generated frames were in there. As of the recording of this review, there are 35 games that are already slated for support of DLSS 3.0 
and one of those is Microsoft Flight Sim, which you can watch in our live stream either tonight, if you wanna see that, if you're watching this in the morning of uh, Embargo Day, or tomorrow, Wednesday. You've got Cyberpunk 2077 that I'm excited about, Witcher 3 Remastered, Portal, and Hogwarts are gonna be the ones that I'm probably the most stoked about. There's a lot of smaller ones in there, but those are the ones that I was like, yeah, that's gonna be awesome. But like I said, we really kind of focus on game performance, etc. but it's definitely needing to be mentioned that we also have the inclusion of the AV1 codec for streaming and encoding, the improvements in the GPU-powered rendering programs like DaVinci Resolve, they are claiming we have some more playable numbers if you are one of like the only 12 people on the planet looking to game at 8K. It is so far beyond the scope of our testing, but I'm sure that Linus will get some like paid NVIDIA video soon that will likely show it off. So make sure that you tune in there to check it out. Okay, so that's our full overview and just number rundown of the RTX 4090. So Roby, should I buy it? Well, this is always the question that only you, yes, you can really truly answer. But let me walk you through what I would do if it was my money and I was making the decision. This is an upwards of $2,000 card. Unless you get an FE, then it's only $1,599. But I have no idea, guys no practical idea how easy these are gonna to be to get. And more than likely, partner cards are gonna be far more available and you're gonna spend money on them and not everybody likes the look or the lack of RGB of the Founders Edition card. So you're, you're spending, let's say worst case, 2000 bucks. Here's the deal, all of the high-end 3000 series cards, which are well south of 1000 bucks, can game at 1440p at all of the highest refresh rates across any major FPS title, Fortnite, Apex, COD, and Valorant. 200 plus FPS in Cyberpunk, Witcher, or Portal? Nope. Honestly, they're ideal at 60 frames per second as single player cinematic experiences. Again, really hard to justify the cost. Now, let's say you wanna be a 4K gamer. Well, then the answer actually becomes pretty easy. This card is a true 4K gamer's dream. I cannot wait to use this card to play Witcher and Cyberpunk and Hogwarts on either RAW at 60 FPS plus or with DLSS, XESS, or FSR at 120 plus frames per second. Not that I need it, but it's awesome to have that option at 4K. See, that's where this card excels. And for people who have the budget to build high end, then the extra $300 or $400 above the 3090 Ti, if you get an FE card, is very much worth it at this resolution. I really do feel that we have 4K gaming here. And, and I'm guessing that the 4080 and the other ones, when we get to testing those, will allow similarly at slower, like at slightly less resolution and probably a better budget. But again, if you want the highest of the high end for 4K gaming, this is the card for you. Oh, and, and I guess for you 8K gamers, you can also check it out. I'd love to know down in the comments below if, if that's you, because I heard if I can find all 12 of you, I actually get a prize. Now, there is one group I kind of ignored, and that's the 1080p FPS eSport crowd. I can say for you that this card doesn't make sense. See, this card, this card's amazing. And, and it's a generational leap in the beginning of mainstream form gaming that a lot of folks at the high end of the budget and gaming spectrum have been waiting for. But should you buy it right now? Because tomorrow is the day I, I have to, I, do I buy it, Roby? Well, I'm guessing you're gonna be pretty safe because even with RDNA 3.0 on the horizon a month from now, at the high end, Nvidia still has a better adoption rate than AMD's technology. And if they, even if they do end up being more powerful card, meaning the 7000 series Radeon, then there are more than enough trade-offs with AMD, driver stability being one of them, as we had 11 crashes in our testing on the 6950 XT versus zero on Nvidia with pre-release drivers. And I doubt even with a lower price and maybe slightly better performance, you're gonna have any buyer's remorse. It is, however, worth noting, I, I am gonna say this, that if you're rocking the latest Ryzen 7000, it may be worth waiting to see what RDNA 3 does bring, given I still think there's some cool synergy that is going to be unlocked by a unified architecture that could make a 7000 series AMD card a better fit than a, a 4090 NVIDIA card. I still want awesome from RDNA 3.0 because I still think that there is room for these guys to, to be better from budget. There's room for these guys to be better with pricing. And honestly, Intel was right. They showed that great thing in terms of the overall upwards cost of what it takes to do DIY nowadays. And, and we, need, we need more competition in this space. But you know what? I'd love to know what you think. 
And I'd love to know all of that down in the comments below. See that like, like and subscribe down there just staring at you longingly? Well, why not press it? So that way you can know and see more of our videos just like this one on like RDNA 3.0 and the, 13, the 13th gen Intel series that are coming up. Did you know we're gonna be live benching our 4090 in a build, of course, and I'm doing tons of builds with 4090s with a ton of the, the partner cards. Then you should come watch because we have a live stream channel, the big brother of Robitech over at Robitech Live. You can check for the details down in the description so you can like and subscribe there and not miss our builds and benchmarks like we do every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday over at twitch.tv slash Robitech at 5 p.m. Pacific time or live here at youtube.com slash Robitech live. Do you want to talk about the 4090 or even the RDNA 3.0 or any other tech related content? Then jump on over to our Discord server over at discord.gg slash Robitech. We have other tech and PC enthusiasts that love to chat about these very subjects. Also, remember our data shared there and who knows, you might make a friend. By the way, did you see this fire video of us doing 8.2 gigahertz LN2 overclocking on a 13900K with Splave over on our Instagram reel? Or did you see that TikTok of us showing off a Gen 5 NVMe heatsink on the MSI Z790 board? See, you could be missing all that content too. So you should join us at Robitech everywhere on all the other socials so you don't miss the daily content we post absolutely everywhere. Anyway, folks, I hope you did enjoy this episode and we look forward to seeing you on the next one.